right, my name is Brecken Cosley, and I am interviewing Mrs. Uh, Bel or Melanie Brem for the Veterans History Project in partnership with the Office of Congressman Burgess Owens. Today is o Monday, October 23rd, 2023, and we're holding this interview at the West Jordan District Office. Hi, Melanie, how are you? Hi, Thank I'm you fine. Thank you for participating. You're um, welcome. We're just gonna start with some uh, biographical details. So if you just wanna tell us uh, your name, where you were born, your parents, um, if any of them have served in the military, anything like that. So if you want to start with where you were born and your parents and if you have any siblings. Name again. So. Or n maybe not name, but where you were born and okay. your family situation. I'm from Salem, Oregon. Well, I was born in Salem, Oregon. They moved that weekend, so I grew up in Corvallis, Oregon. And my dad is from a whole family of Marines. He served as a Marine. My son served as a Marine. All my cousins were Marines. I went Army. <laughs> and then, um, did you hold any jobs before entering the service? Yes. And what were those jobs? Um, Oregon State University, Horticulture Department, and a couple of other, just off and on here and there, temp jobs. I was supposed to go in after the summer, so. And then you joined, um, I guess, after high school immediately or after working for the college? I had to wait for my 18th birthday, which was June. So I graduated June, and then a few weeks later, I signed the papers. Wow. And then I didn't get in until October. How did your family feel about you joining the military? They weren't happy. Why? <laughs> they didn't think much of women in the military. Is that because they were all prior Marines? Or no, that would be my mother. Your mother? Was she worried about just your safety and security? I don't really know. Yeah. Okay. Um, well, I believe you briefly told me a little bit about you um, joining with one of your friends. You want to go into that, right. that um, story a little bit? The um, Army had the two-year buddy program, and so my friend and I were going to go in. And um, if you took three years, you got your duty station as well. But I chose just two years because I was LDS at the time, and um, I considered it to be a mission. Absolutely. And then did your friend join the military as well? No. No. My other friend did, though. And then several others from my senior class, including the valedictorian girl and uh, most popular girl and everything because we all wanted to go to college mm -hmm. and that was another reason my parents were told by my high school counselor that I wasn't smart enough to do anything other than typing and answering a phone but I know that I was dyslexic which is why my certain scores in math and all that were not good And I asked specifically from my recruiter, I told them I wanted to do something top secret. Mm -hmm. And um, I was a communications, um, I ran a shift of eight, eight women and men. And um, then I also was the one that ran the crypto unit only. And so after going through basic training and stuff, what was tech school like for, for crypto and communications? Crypto, I didn't learn until I got to Germany, but um, we just did the all the other. Well, I did have to learn the Morse codes and all the different codes and things, but other than that, everything was on the job, more or less. Yeah. And what year did you join the military? Um, that would have been 1974. And then what time did you, or what date did you leave? Uh, again, October 74, or 76, sorry. What was your most vivid memory of your time in training or in school? What was the best part? What was the worst part? The best part of training? Mm -hmm. Either basic training or tech training? I would say basic training was a lot of fun to me. I mean, to me it was easy. It was like going to camp mm -hmm. and, and 
when I was a kid and uh, everybody else was having a hard time getting their hair upright or making sure they didn't have a wrinkle or you know whatever it was they asked of us it was simple and easy to do and they just couldn't seem to get it straight so that I thought it was kind of funny but I don't know it was fun for me the worst part of that would have been the AIT school. And why is that? Um, because I was assaulted. Oh, I'm so sorry. I'm sorry. I don't, we can stop the interview if you want. Or no. I spent all weekend trying to let myself let it go. Okay. Um, that's called shadow work. Okay. And uh, I have a life coach that's helping me with that. Okay. And, um, I can say honestly, the VA has made everything worse. They just kept, you know, making it worse instead of better. And that was one of the reasons I didn't want to do anything in a group. Um, As a part of um, your uh, assignments, uh, what was the first assignment after basic training or after tech? Um, my one and only assignment was in Germany. In Germany. Pirmasans, Germany, on the Alsace-Lorraine French border. And how many other people were at that location? Uh, Huster Hull Concern, 267th Signal Company, probably 150 people that I was aware of. There might have been others. It was half German on one side and and U.S. was renting the other side. Oh, wow. What kind of friendship or um, camaraderie did you form while serving in North Dome? Well, Mary Jo went through with me from boot camp to AIT school, and we were roommates in Germany. Um, and then I made a couple of friends that were in other departments, just whatever. And one of those girls was raped. She, was, she worked for the colonel, the base, com base com post officer. Um, and um, she got out. She got beat up really bad. Okay. So then nobody could go out when you get it off of work. It's usually very dark and um, we couldn't go out anywhere unless we were escorted from that point on. The so last. What did you do, I guess, for recreation when you were off duty? I was never off duty. Um, we had terrorist alert, terrorist attack. People were being killed from Munich on up and they had just got the guys over in Zweibrück and um, which was, I think, less than 20 miles away. And uh, I was on my way to do a church conference at midnight, get off, so I had to do the last um, flash traffic of top secret stuff and get that all done. And um, the guy that was replacing me was late, so I was actually late leaving. And um, my bus was supposed to be there at midnight, and they were supposed to sit and wait because they knew I might be late. And uh, I went to leave, finally, and um, something hit me. It was, a, it was a little narrow walkway between the front of the building and the back of the building over the parade field and into our barracks. And um, something fell on my head, so I looked up and I s counted seven people crossing from the motor pool roof to the 267th signal roof. And, um, I'm going, okay, I can't go backwards. It's very bright on that side of the building. It was very dark on the other side of the building. And um, they had an overhang of that, but I couldn't go across the field either because they, if they were stopping at the communications just a few feet away, they would see me if I tried to cross the field. So I had to duck waddle all the way around the field and um, ran in. Uh, told the CQ guy, he says, call the MPs, there's terrorists on the roof. And then I called back to the, the guy that I had just relieved me. And I said, what do you want me to do? Hang around? What not? And um, I don't know. I, they said, go ahead and get on the bus. So I just quickly changed my clothes, went out, looked, the MPs were running in um, with their different little jeeps and things blue lights flashing quietly, no no noise, and um, I jumped on the bus and I said, you need to go, those are terrorists on the roof, there's going to be gunfire or something, 
and they saw the police and everybody's like, whoa, and just, just right at that moment, the whole bluff roof blew off right where I had just left in my crypto unit. It was locked up. Nobody else could get in there or anything. But um, So I just barely missed getting blowed up. And um, we went on, on the rest of the night and ended up in, uh, I'm trying to think where it was. It was on the border of Austria where Hitler's eagle's nest was. And um, I was a, one of the um, church um, leaders, female, for all of that area for um, Switzerland and Germany and whatnot. And, um, I had to change that, though, because of the terrorist attacks. Everybody was didn't want to work, um, got drunk, got busted their security clearance, so I was always working double shifts and even woke up in the middle of the night if something came through that they couldn't deal with. So. I mean, usually I worked swings in graveyard, and Amelia worked the day shift, the, the E6 guy. Um, and then they put, when I came back, they had put our van out, tactical van out, and we had to work out of that. And they told us, here's your weapons, here's your uh, ammos over here on the, it's a U-shaped thing. So you go up, in, round, and down. <laughs> And going, well, what good does it deal me over there? And he goes, it doesn't matter. You'll be blowed up and never know anything. So that always stuck with me. But we were busy. We were really busy all the time. So, But they all got caught. The seven got caught. And they all died, unfortunately. Um, chose They have a, where they starve, choose to starve. And Germany doesn't force feed them. So. They all seven died. And I kind of felt guilty about that, you know, but I was just doing my job. And uh, it, it was one thing I never thought when I decided to go into the service, mainly to get my GI Bill so I could go to college. And uh, it was after Vietnam, and well, it was still Vietnam, I think. I, I was kind of in the middle there, but um, it, was, it wasn't, I didn't expect to be in a war zone <laughs> type thing with terrorists and all that. Why did you feel guilty? Because I'm not a killer. And technically, in an off way, doing my job, I got them killed. But they chose it that way. They didn't have to commit suicide. Exactly. And did your organization's mission, did that change after the terrorist attack? I don't think so. I never heard anything about it. But you guys were moved from the building. Like oh, the well, building just on. just our group that were doing the, the um, traffic. It's a dusty, I forget now, digital switching terminal equipment. Um, that's where you put it on ticker tape and you ship it on out after it's been coded, decoded, and all that kind of stuff. And, um, <laughs> This be really hard. Um, I don't know. It it lasted from fall until spring. I remember it ended in the spring, and uh, I had my brother had gotten married in the fall, and I couldn't go because of my security clearance. I couldn't go to a lot of places in there, so I didn't get to go like to Holland or any of the little. I like to travel, so. I wanted and Mary Jo. I can understand how she got to go. So, and anyhow, and um, I met Ben for um, host the nation educational thing. He was from France, um, going to Paris, and he invited me to his wedding. He, he, we met on the train. I was going up to do a church. Um, I don't remember now what it was. Some kind of church function, and uh, in Munich or in uh, Heidelberg, Heidelberg. And uh, really, so I was writing, and it turned out it was the Paris West train, which is, you know, Murder on the Orient Express and all that, <laughs> which I'm a big movie person, so, you know, I like to see places and go places that I've seen on TV, for real, and meet people. And I met a lot of uh, uh, German people. Um, the, um, they have, like, oh, I get mixed up and move my brain around. 
Um, anyhow, so I, I went up there and I was on the train and he came in and, and I had taken French in high school and he, he said something about her something like that and that wasn't in the words of my vocabulary and I'm thinking he said something about lowering the window and 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 the family uh, kind of would be mine so I, and I finally figured it out and it says oh no go ahead you know <laughs> he wanted to smoke his pipe <laughs> and um, it turned out we were born on the same day 20 years apart and uh, he was really cool and he was telling me about his girlfriend that he'd had for over 20 years and and uh, she was from a very wealthy family and in France you don't marry outside your class or whatever and um, so he didn't ask her and I and I said okay how long have you been dating oh and he said almost 20 years and I go well she's weighty <laughs> so he um, he went home and he asked her to marry him and they got I was invited to the wedding but I had already been uh, shipped out and uh, couldn't get back and uh, I thought that was cool get that would have been really fun to, she was from um, Mon Monaco that Cameron place and um, and people that were doing other things one one thing I did get to do right after all that everything in, that summer was uh, they have Pyramazons has seven hills and they whirl down kind of like a peeling apple core or something and um, they um, had a race can't remember now what it was called but one of my uh, friends um, that was at the switching station um, microwave stuff and um, her boyfriend George had a hot rod and so he drove she was with him in the went along in the back seat just for the fun of it and it was kind of scary because it was real narrow and you could you had to go as fast you could it was whoever got the best time so I don't believe we came in I don't know how many people there were actually so somewhere or at least 10 people were in front of us and there was a line in behind us so I don't think we made it the, the thing but I don't think he made a winning or anything like that but so that was just fun and then I go out with the missionaries and um, they they taught me German while I was there and when you get to Germany you get uh, I think it was a month long host the nation program where you also learn enough German to get around wo ist der Zug mit Frankfurt bitte where's the train for Frankfurt type stuff and, um, there was there was a couple of guys that were in close by but far enough away that um, I never saw them because the bus didn't go that way and I didn't drive a car or anything there. I do remember when we first got there, Mary Jo and I were off, we were taken to Worms, Worms and um, we had to get paperwork done and then we were to be um, taken by bus to there and they were trying really hard to get either one of us to become a driver for a general and when we had gotten off the plane and gotten onto the Autobahn there was a massive very bloody 20 car um, crash because they don't have us they didn't back that time have a speed limit or anything so we t looked at each other and we go no we went to a lot of trouble to be trained to come and do this and we're going to do it <laughs> so, so. Well, sounds like you had a lot of fun experiences while you're in Germany. Do you uh, maintain any kind of relationships or contact with those that you made friends with back in Germany? Oh, most of them are in America now. Oh, <laughs> so, um, the girls, not so much. I lost contact with them. I mean, it was one of those weird things where, like when I would get on the train to ride from Pirmasans to Frankfurt, um, they, they had little conductor guys I mean they were right out of high school too they were like 18 or so and dressed in you know the conductor outfits and everything and they wanted to have their picture made with me and when they found out I was in the army because <laughs> I was dressed in my Italian outfit that I'd gotten to to go to this meeting that I was going to and um, they, they were just very funny 
And then the same thing happened at the airport. They, oh, they had told me also that in Germany, everybody has to volunteer for two years. And um, they didn't, I don't think they said women, but the guys had to do it. And then that way they got their education and everything for free. And um, they were just really nice and friendly. Everybody was friendly to me. So I was, then the girls and the missionaries. Um, other than that, the only thing I got into trouble with was my c company commander, Captain Juan, who was LDS, um, and I babysat his five girls because I'm just really good at babysitting, I guess, back then. And, um, hey, sit, sit, sit. And uh, one of the girls got jealous for some reason because she goes, why are you always going to his house? And I go, well, I'm babysitting for him. It's a job. And um, I don't know, for some reason she got really, really angry and said, so, oh, I know what it was. You're not supposed to... Um, use anything other than code words when you're changing over the code keys when during the night when you're supposed to and um, she was flirting with them and talking with them you're not supposed to do that and I, I didn't say anything and didn't say anything to anybody I just said you need to stop doing that because uh, you know you get you can get into trouble for doing that and the next thing I know I'm getting called in and I'm the one that's getting in trouble and I didn't do anything apparently she she gave them a code for me so that uh, and uh, was using it and uh, I don't know it was, it, she was it, she was, I think she was from Hawaii I can't remember she was very nice but she was I don't know she didn't want to be there for some reason she d made a mistake and didn't want to be in the military. She's a party girl, I guess. And then a um, couple of other wives of some of the guys I worked with. Um, I'd meet them at Market Square where you go downtown and every Wednesday and Saturday and you can buy fresh fruit and vegetables and uh, flowers and things, and stuff like that. So yeah, I did, in the end, the last few months, um, I, I got to go to a, a couple of castles, a, a lake, and I went with Mary Jo, because we never went anywhere alone. And um, So I did get to do a little traveling, finally. And then when I went, well, when I went home in the spring to meet my new sister-in-law and all that, um, something about the Concorde was coming down and that was the first time I'd ever seen it. We landed in Paris at the same time type thing and that was pretty cool. So I had gotten a passport and I wanted to stamp my passport <laughs> but we were supposed to be in civilian clothes, not have our dog tags out or anything like that and use our passports. And um, so, I, so I go out the gates out in the front of the, the, ho the airport and um, come back in through just so I could get my passport stamped. They wouldn't do it. And they were young kids too in the, in the military type doing the passport things and checking people out. And he goes, and they wanted their picture made with me too. And I thought, okay, that's strange. But um, that's pretty much the fun. Oh, one more fun thing. Across from our, you go out the gate and across down, the, down a hill, there's a really tight cavern-like thing. And so we were down there sunbathing on this big rock in our swimsuits. And the next thing we know, these jets come zooming by. And it's German jets. And they're like, um, I don't know, they were going really fast. But they were like down in the cave, cavern, almost eye level with us and everything. And they waved. And so we waved back. And they just kept going around and around for a while and I guess they had certain stuff they were supposed to do. That was funny, I thought. That's really, that's really interesting. Oh, okay. One more time. Yeah. One more thing. Okay, Mary Jo's a prankster and uh, I think we, I was always going out after double shifts 
to wind down and I would catch the helicopter rides as they were going out if I was just happened to have a got off a swing double the morning day and the swing shift in time to do that and uh, so she says what do you do when you do that and I go, we just fly around <laughs> it's just relaxing and um, she goes oh well, I'm gonna go with you on your birthday so unknown to me she had made an arrangement with the pilot and the co-pilot and they changed the seats from this way to that way so that you could you know go out, have your feet hanging out and um, the next thing I know they're all saying okay we got you strapped in and turned sideways for a reason Melanie <laughs> and I go okay he says close your eyes and so I close my eyes and he says, don't open them until we tell you to and then wave and um, so I'm like, okay. And then they say, okay, open your eyes and wave. And so I did. And it was a, a huge bonfires all over. And it was a nudist camp. <laughs> and they were all waving back at us and everything. So yeah, she liked to play practical jokes on me. Because she was the Catholic girl. I was the Mormon girl. <laughs> yeah. It sounds like you had a lot of really... So, yeah. Unique experiences. Different, yeah. The last, the last six months was okay. Good. Uh, do you recall the day your service ended? And then what, uh, where were you? Oh, yeah. That incident. Um, okay. Well, what? You had to go to, I can't, launch, launch stool. Launch stool is where the hospital was and, um, for out processing. And um, so I went over there, a, a guy from, in a deuce and a half came and got me as, and drove me over there and, and um, was supposed to wait and pick me up and take me back. And uh, while I was in there, um, they didn't tell me what they were gonna do or anything. And it's, um, Yeah, this one, I, this one I can already see the blood splatting, okay, yeah, but so that's okay. Uh, it'll, it'll pass. Um, How did you readjust to civilian life? We'll just skip the out processing part altogether, if that's okay with you. you no, nope, I got to tie it up. So okay, this yeah. is part of letting it go. Um, so all of a sudden I got very popular as I was getting ready to out process. And everybody's wanting to date me. And, and everybody knew I didn't go out with anybody but LDS guys. And um, so finally I asked one of my friends that was married, I said, why is everybody asking me out? And he goes, there's a pool running and it's up to $1,600. Uh, who can, um, I always use the word, de-virginize you, but I don't know. It, anyhow, and I go, really? <laughs> and. Um, So anyhow, so then when I went to out process, when I in processed, um, they split us in half. They said, anybody that's uh, sexually active, go this way. Anybody that's not, go into this room. Okay, well over three quarters of the people went to the room where they weren't, were still virgins. And um, I always remember that part. So I didn't, I go, what? And we were all like very innocent, didn't know what the heck was going on. They didn't tell us anything. And then, so um, we're all thinking, well, what are they doing? And one girl says, I heard that one was pregnant and she wants a free abortion type thing. And I'm going, really? And, that, so, and then I just forgot about it. I didn't think anything about it until out processing and everybody, you know, trying to get the pool for having sex with me. And um, I went in and the guy says, get up on the table. Um, there was a nice nurse there um, back in the background. And then I, he says, I want you to lay down and spread your legs. And I'm thinking to myself, what, why? And he didn't explain anything. The next thing I know, um, he's just jabbing something in me and blood, I just saw blood go everywhere. And I, I relive that over and over. That is the one that sticks out even over the guy that attacked me in, in Georgia. Um, at knife point, I forgot to tell you that one, didn't I? Uh, but, um, so yeah, I had two major traumas with sex involved with sex. But, 
um, wasn't expecting to get out and anyhow so I go to get out he's like runs out of there he's like shock on his face and it's all bloody and his glasses are all bloody and it's dripping everywhere and I'm like how can there be so much blood and um, the lady uh, comes over and, and starts helping me get cleaned up and everything and he left I never saw him again and later when I left I thought okay he won the pool <laughs> but he didn't know it um, at least that's the way I looked at it and um, no I never did get over that the, um, it was very important to me to be and they took that away from me When you came back to the States, did you apply for VA compensation and how have you felt? I never saw it had anything to do with the VA until I was 50 something years old and that was only because I'd had an injury accident and I needed an MRI. And so I went up to see if I could get an MRI. And um, they said yes. And she, she, they just happened to say, um, did you have any military sexual trauma? Because it was sexual trauma month. Every month they had a different thing or something, but I only went a couple of times at first, and um, I didn't say anything, I don't think. I didn't report it in Georgia because back in the day when I was that age, uh, the police in our my hometown and everything um, more or less figured you got what you deserved if something happened to you, that um, you were either dressing lewdly or this, that, and the other. It was, it was an era that, that was going on when I was there. And um, I don't know, it was, it was pretty much okay. I mean, he jerked my arm back and up and it comes out, out of its socket all the time ever since. And what, okay. So, um, but yeah, every now and then, this is the one, he's the one that um, they always ask me questions at and stuff and whatnot and didn't seem to care about the other guy. But um, he had, had uh, Mary Jo and them had all, my roommates had all gone off post to um, drink and I didn't drink. so. I was going right to the back of the building. It was just right across and back. And the next thing I know, oh, sorry. No, no, it's okay. It's just with. Oh, oh he went over on your thing. Yeah. Oh. Do you need a glass of water or something? Yeah, I, he might, yeah, he might want some yeah, water. Being close to the mic there. Yeah, he's like panting into your mic. Uh, I got your bowl. Okay. Here, can we get some water in there? There you go. All right, you. Did I? Sorry about that. Yeah, no worries. And please, like, if any other questions well, they bring up. It comes and goes. I just, I just good question. remember my little mantras. Yeah, that's good. <laughs> Things. So. How have you found, like, the military sexual trauma treatment at the VA? Terrible. Really? Why is that? They just made me angrier and angrier. And they kept wanting me to be in group things and like it's a group thing. I go, rape is a violent thing. It's not a sexual thing. It's got some guy's got an issue with a woman and he's, you know, beating her up and taking it. There you go. There you go. Say no. <laughs> okay, we'll leave you down there. Okay, lay down, maybe. So with that, uh, oh, he'll go with. We may want to try some of those questions again, just okay. to make sure that we get the good audio there. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Now I lost track. I, I, my brain goes. Yeah. No, it's no. afternoon. So when you, just like when you left the military and stuff, um, did you find readjusting to schooling and life easy? Was it hard? I put it all out of my mind and buried it, and um, was interested in going to school and I wanted to um, I had to get a job between now and then or then and going to school and um, my first job was a police dispatcher 
and then a couple of more sh temporary jobs and things until I, I ended up turned around. I turned out I married um, an LDS guy that um, that um, he he um. He was the only guy that wrote me while I was in the service, now that I think about it. But I didn't realize that he had other things in mind, but I figured nobody else is going to marry me. I'm, you know, what do you call the word? Damaged goods, whatever, the way church people put it. And then um, the other people. Oh, there was one guy that I went met in Austria that was in the Air Force, and he had said, um, I told him about him harassing me, wanting, you know, just to do that. And he goes, well, if for any reason, any reason at all, because he, he, he wanted to date me and we lived way far apart in, in the country and, and stuff. So I said, well, um, and I thought of him as a friend, so I, it wasn't an option. But um, anyhow, the other guy was uh, just using me because I had a, a good paying job and he quit his job but didn't tell me that and he like I signed my paychecks because I always worked graveyard jobs go figure I guess I got used to it in the army and um, so she he's uh, he says just put him in the door or whatever and um, so I'd sign my check paycheck over and he'd take it and party on it and um, you okay baby Drink. Don't drink so he fast. Drink too fast yeah. yeah, he drink. He's got a trachea problem. <coughs> so he's. Yeah. He'll stop. Go. He usually stays with Wes. Go hang out. Um. Let's see what else. Anyhow, oh, so he wanted. He lied to me and wanted to. Um. I don't know. He he somehow just asked, did I want to get married? And I'm going, I want to go to school. <laughs> and uh, he says, well, you we can do both. We can go there together. I don't know. But for some reason, it stuck in my head. Well, that's one way to get over the stigma in the LDS church. And um, I don't know. We, we got married on January 29th, 1977, and divorced, I filed for a divorce March, St. Patrick's Day, March 77, and then I met my son's dad later, I, I, and I was, I was, I don't know what the word is to call that, that's when everything started catching up to me, and, and I'm going, you know. I'm not even good enough for him, type thing, and um, my you know, self-esteem just plummeted big time, and I just, I got to where I was, um, <sighs> depressed and suicidal, and, and actually that happened, I did write a suicide note before I left the, the when I was, just before I left the Army, I can't remember now what happened, but it was right after seeing that doctor, I believe, and um, and I, I I wasn't all that up on how you killed yourself type thing, and um, I had a huge bottle of aspirin or something. <laughs> I just you know didn't know, and so I took it, wrote a note, and uh, didn't expect to wake up. I woke up though and had the best sleep ever, so I remember that. And then I forgot all that again, and um, then I got out, and the marriage and everything, and it stopped, brought it, started bringing things back, and um, my son's dad was bugging me to marry him. I mean, we got, I got divorced on a Friday, and we got married on a Monday, and I was in, what do you, there's a word for that, too, where you just marry on the fly type thing. Didn't matter. Nothing mattered. Didn't care about anything. And um, he was younger, a couple of years younger. And, um, and he just kept 
after me and after me and after me. And I said, oh, well, what the heck? And, um, and I'd already signed up to go into the Navy, and I was waiting to get called to do that. And then um, we got married at the Justice of the Peace. And I just figured, oh, well, have a short little marriage and go on into the Navy. And um, I was going to do the same thing that I did in the Army. And it didn't. I mean, we ended up, I ended up turning down the military and um, started remembering, you know, how it was and everything. And, but I still, I don't know. And, and then the other guy, the second husband, was almost, almost like the first one. They're both narcissists. They both um, treated me like I wasn't there. I, mean, I had to walk behind one of them, and um, he'd talk to people, and if I spoke up, he'd get angry and stuff like that. And I go, I don't want this. I'm better than this. But then I'd get depressed, and then I think, no, I'm not better than this. And you know, just it was a vicious circle. Of, uh, and then he actually asked me to um, try and um, kill myself so that he could get out of the service. And I'm like, okay. This is the second husband. This is the second husband. And I'm like, okay. Cause, and I felt bad for him because his dad had told him he was terrible stuff and wasting his life in the military. And, um, so he got it in his, whatever issues he had with his parents, he got it in his head that he had to get out. So I said, okay, fine. I've done it once, so I'll do it again. And at that point, I said, I don't even care. I just literally did not care if I made it or not. And um, the lady next door had come over. And um, I was talking on the phone to the CEO's wife um, just to let him know so that he'd get his credit. And um, the, um, I had a 357 Magnum, but I had it sitting there with me. But, but I was drunk. I took everything in the house that time. It was going to kill me. And um, it turned out that um, I don't know. This Lemay, his name was Lemay, Commander Lemay of the ship. He, his wife, came out with whoever she, she called, and they revived me enough to get me in the vehicle and. I remember her saying, she's so young and pretty, and I'm thinking to myself, yeah, right. But I, you know, I didn't move, I was really out of it, and um, I woke up somewhere where they were making, every, making me throw up everything that I'd taken, and they were like counting on this, that, and the other, and stuff, and yeah. And, uh, the guy goes, yeah, she wouldn't have made it. And I'm thinking to myself, why can't I just die? I'm so humiliated. I just don't want to keep going. And I just never told anybody all this stuff. So. Maybe you were so uncomfortable with the but, but a lot of weird things like that keep starting in again. and. This lady that I use as a shadow work um, to get rid of things that keep coming up in your life. It's people trying to attack me or do this, that, or the other, and I'm going, why, why, why is this keep coming up? And so she explained it to me and everything, and and uh, I have to let it go. So that's why I decided to finally say something, just so I can let it go. That's so, healthy. Yeah. so that's why I didn't want to be in the group thing because I don't want to hear anybody else's business because then mine just keeps going and going and going and going in my head until I 
do something to stop it. I would assume, have you joined a veterans organization at all? Mm, organization? Yeah, like a American Legion, Veterans of Home Wars, Save of American Veterans. The DAV sent me something in the mail because they were the ones that went to my hearing. But um, there's like other people wanting money and I didn't have money. So. Yeah. How, um, what are some of the more positive life lessons that you've learned from your military service. We've kind of we've gone over, unfortunately, the traumas that you endured. But maybe to end on like a more positive note, so you feel like it wasn't, you know. Well, it, it wasn't a total loss. It was like a yo-yo or um, something, just a kaleidoscope, just happy doing this, working, literally working myself out. Um, I felt proud of the work I did. Um, I just wondered why everybody kept bothering me the way they were, um, humiliating me or attacking me or whatnot. And, um, still, those are bright lights. All right. Um, happier things. I did. I did meet a few nice people. I did get to go to Europe. Did get to go to a castle. Went to a, a dig site for our French border. Um, the missionaries went with us because, you know, oddly enough, they have Hochdeutsch, the borderline, border slang. So we had a little bit of German, and I had a little bit of French. <laughs> And the, the missionaries ended up speaking German with them very fluently and stuff. But Mary Jo took me there for, because I always had, at home, I always had Chinese for my uh, food at, with my family for my birthday every year without fail. And um, I told her that, and so she surprised me with that. And they, uh, my friend um, John, that was my counterpart for church stuff again, I was able to start doing some of my stuff and I was helping they were had a German branch Gemeinde and I was so I was working with the young girls that were learning to do counterpart stuff and and um, that kind of thing and they took us through a cemetery one night and um, on the outside were all these graves that were Jewish people apparently she said they could not be inside the cemetery and I thought well that you know, so I got a little bit of culture and things from different people that actually live there. And, um, oh, when I um, uh, babysat for uh, Captain Mon um, one night, they had a one of those $200 a person plate things where he had to go. And uh, he and his wife went. And um, so I stayed and took care of the kids. And apparently my ID card had fallen out in his closet. So when I went to go to work the next day, I couldn't go to work. And so they had me uh, rush in to uh, downtown where the military police were. And you weren't supposed to wear your uniform still, but it wasn't that big of a deal by that time. And um, the, um, so I had my picture made and got a new one. And, and then I, so I get back in and start back to work. And, and I'm like, OK. That's interesting. Um, oh no, that's a bad ending. <sighs> it's okay. You don't have to that's change. No, your story well, well, it's not a. Like well, that's. Ending. I had taken um, the CEO's wife to, um, not wife, children in a taxi downtown to Kafala. It's, it's kind of like a toy story, clothing story. A different floor had different stuff. And I took the girls and I gave them finnings and you know German money, and um, I said, buy buy each of your sisters something and buy um, something for your whoever you want, mom and dad or whatever. And um, I got in trouble for that. So apparently someone found out, my friend from other things, and um, so he had me call. He I was supposed to babysit. I came over. 
And uh, he says, I'm sorry, but I can't have you uh, working for us anymore. And I need to repay the money that you gave the children. I go, why? And so he explained it and I go, okay, I guess I can sort of see it. But I remember crying all the way. That's the first time I've ever cried. Um, crying all the way back. And I walked by myself that time. I didn't care. So I'm going, because that basically, that was my only ride to church either. And so I'm like, because there are no LDS people on the post. And um, I'm like, okay. Yeah, so anyhow, got my ID and I got sidetracked. Um, I went to get on the bus and um, this little old lady, German lady, starts screaming and throwing, gonna hit me with her umbrella, I think it was. And, and I'm like, only picking out a few words and the two women that were with her said, um, she lost her husband and all her ch sons in the war, World War II. And, uh, and I wrote a poem about that later, and it was published. Really? So. Wow. Do you have a copy of the poem? I have looked high and low. Mm -hmm. I have not found stuff since I, I went to Kentucky to um, house it for my son while he was in Afghanistan. And my dad ups and ships all my stuff there. And I'm like, what did he do that for? And, and when I got, I know, somewhere along the way, when Wes got back, he and his wife were in it. But I knew she was cheating on her because I could hear them all night long. They were just over me. I was sleeping in the bath in the basement. Yeah. Um, um, I don't know. It, he says, okay, I need to, to get you out of here. And, uh, so, so that's when I, uh, he put me on a bus. I met a bunch of Amish people, but that was an interesting trip too. Um, but now I've lost track of what I was saying. That's okay. Uh, what message would you like to leave for future generations? Oh, okay. Future generations? Yeah. Well, when I got um, all the younger girls at church were all excited and they went on it. I told them a lot of terrible things that happened to me and, and they were still went in. So go figure. And, um, future generations now. The lady across the street um, daughter was thinking about going in so she asked me a bunch of things. I said well there's pros and cons and it's a lot different now than it was um, but I still understand that um, there's more people being raped including men. My older brother who was a Vietnam era veteran also um, that was back then though his CO and XO raped him when he was 19. He was so good looking and he, he, so, yeah. So it's like, oh my God. And I didn't know at the time, I knew nothing about it at the time because he didn't ever tell anybody until I got out. And uh, I was talking about something to someone on the phone and uh, he overheard it. And he, he did say something, but afterwards, when I asked him something else about it, he says, I never said no such thing. Never happened, type thing. But, and I always feel bad to be an alcoholic and just, he had good jobs and everything. I helped him get on at HP where I was working. But um, he, he was never happy after that. He was a different person. I didn't recognize him. I'm so sorry. And so I basically lost my family, lost my friends, lost my self-esteem, lost everything that was important to me. Um, excommunicated myself from the church. Um, and so a happy ending. I did learn that Religion is not the same as spirituality. And so that's why I started seeing all these other different spiritual people, light workers is what they're called. And they're 
you don't begin your tithing, you don't do this or that, you just go and you meditation and you learn to take care of yourself and um, that's where I started doing things to actually help me and get my, me back to being me that I was before I ever went in anywhere. That's the most important part. So, um, I don't know, I pretty much shut down for a long time, so I didn't really interact with anybody that much, other than people that, if I had a job where I was working with people under me, like at Oregon State University, I, I had students working under me, like seven of them or something like that. And just, you know, just be friendly. I didn't hang out, didn't go to anywhere. All my friends in high school uh, dropped me as a friend. Um, the only one that stayed with me is my older brother's first wife. Um, we still phone each other every Sunday <laughs> type thing. But, um, I, she told me she got divorced finally. <laughs> I'm like, okay. I wasn't seen. I didn't see that one coming. But. And I had one other friend that's in Coeur d'Alene that I was supposed to go live with, and I ended up having to come here because my service dog at the other service dog at the time um, that was the PTSD service dog because the very first vet the lady I okay, I I get mixed up my head starts spinning and um, but she had had put him down as being a PTSD doctor but now dog and now all that went away for some reason all my paperwork keeps disappearing at the VA so anything I've said is gone, apparently so. So I'm like, okay, I just stay by myself, hang with my son. He he can sort of, what do you call it? Speak speak, mom, <laughs> figure out what it is I'm trying to say because this is dyslexia gets worse um, at certain times of day, and I like, I think something and it comes out backwards mm -hmm. somehow. Or, Something like that. So. That's good that you have a kid. Oh. <laughs> well, we're just about out of time, but I just wanted to ask, or just for thoughts, thank you so much for your military service, and thank you for willing, be willing to share with us today about your military service. Is there anything else that you'd like to add before we wrap up the Veterans History Project interview? Um. No, it, it's a process. Apparently, it's a journey that I was meant to take. I don't know if I believe that so much, but that's the way they they tell it like that. Is you had certain things you're supposed to learn when you come to Earth and live, do your journey, and I really don't know about that. So, but other things I think are okay. I mean, I look back at it now. Um, just this past year, because of the VA bringing everything up all the time and stuff, and I, and I go, no, I'm not going to take drugs ever again from you people. I mean, they had me taking all this stuff, and I just, I feel more druggy now than I ever did. <laughs> it's like, I don't do drugs just when I'm trying to kill myself. <laughs> Didn't do that either. Never did them then. Um, I think there are different life lessons just to be learned and gotten through, and I did write a book about it. I have not made up my mind whether I'm going to try and do anything with it. I did it mostly for me so that I could remember things um, because I kept pushing it down and didn't want to remember it, and apparently it's not going to stop until I do remember it, and if I could say anything to anybody that they have to deal with it and not push it down and move forward and it wasn't their fault no matter no matter what was going on they didn't ask to be raped and they didn't ask to be beat up and they didn't ask to be hurt in any way and um, that's about all I can think of